The Sunday before I came here, I was at a wedding for a good friend of mine, and uh, we went to the wedding reception afterwards, and it was great, right, to get together with all friends and family, and, and there's something, uh, just sheer joy about being at a good wedding reception, and I think part of it has to do in the, the nature of the couple. They've just, they've been married for hours at that point, and everything is just perfect. Right? The, the bride is as beautiful as can be, the groom is attentive, everything is just wonderful. Right? And, and you enjoy this moment with a couple, and you enjoy the moment, but you know the moment of perf perfection, how long will that last? They'll go on the honeymoon, and then they come home from the honeymoon, and, and then they begin their life together till death do them part, and then it happens, the first marital argument. Do you remember your first marital argument? Right? Olivia, remember our first marital argument? There's a bulletin cover. Yeah, we got back and, and we got married. We went to annual conference and we went, uh, got married the next, and then we went to a honeymoon. We came back and I was preaching my, about to preach my first sermon and, and we argued about the bulletin cover. It was great. And uh, what's the one skill? My friend John and Emily just got married. What's the one skill they're going to have to learn if they're going to stay together till death do them part? Forgiveness. Right? You're going to have to learn to forgive. Right? You and I, y'all, church, and I, pastor, we're in a moment just like that. We've had our first worship together. and went, went well. Y'all came back. People are smiling as I'm in the room. And as of right this moment, right, you are as beautiful as a bride because you are. Everyone gets along right now. There are no problems. No one's bickering. No one's fighting. Y'all are just perfect. And as of right this moment, I, I have not annoyed, offended, disappointed, dropped the ball. I have so, shown up twice, preached a good sermon, now here I am again. Right? I am as attentive as a groom. Right now, here's this moment, it's just like that wedding reception. Everything is just perfect. Can we take a moment, let us just bask in how perfect it is. <laughs> right? Now I'm going to start getting phone calls at a certain point, two or three months down the road. Well, I'm always talking to my friends who are pastors, and about two to three months down the road, I'm going to get a question. It's a question I've asked other pastors as well when they've gone to new churches, and here's the question. Is the honeymoon over? I guess that's what happens. You start serving a church as a pastor, and at some point, we're going to have a board meeting and a decision is going to be made. Or, or we're going to have a funeral or VBS, or we're going to start doing the work of ministry together, and something is going to happen. And, and, and it might be as small as arguing over a bulletin cover. It might be something larger. But we're, what we're going to have to learn if we're going to live together till Bishop do us part is how to forgive. Right? We're going to have to learn how to forgive each other because we're going to realize we're not perfect. And if we're going to, the essential skill of marriage, the union of two people is forgiveness. The essential skill of a church is, is forgiveness as well, as well. And so what is forgiveness? Let's talk about just the mechanics of forgiveness. If I walked up to you right now and sucker punched you, what would be your inclination? Punch me back. Exactly. Right? If, if someone hurts you, your inclination is to hurt them back. And that moment in which you decide, I'm not going to punch the new pastor, that is a moment of, that's a moment of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a decision you make not to hurt someone who's hurt you. And often the hurt that we, we, we have the opportunity to hurt someone back, often it's not the same as if someone hits me, I don't necessarily have to hit them back to hurt them. I can sue them, or I can talk smack about them, or I can socially ostracize them. I, there's a lot of ways we can get back at someone who's hurt us. So every time that I don't hurt someone who's hurt me, however I, my, my, they have hurt me, and however I might hurt them, that is a moment, a decision of forgiveness. A dis forgiveness Forgiveness is this decision we make again and again and again, because when someone walks in the room that has hurt you before, what do you think about? That they've hurt you before. And you have to decide again, I'm really not going to hurt them again this time. That's what Jesus gets at when he's asked, how often do I forgive? 
Peter asks, how often should I forgive? Seven times? He thinks he's being pretty uh, extravagant. Should I forgive someone seven times? And Jesus says, 70 times seven times, or 77 times, or 70 times 77. The translation there is a little bit confusing, but it, it's, it gets at the, the point pretty clearly. If you know that the numbers in Scripture are often symbolic, and the number seven means complete. And so it's not, he's not saying seven times 70 times because you, you are now going to make a, a tally of 490 times you'll forgive. So that when you, Olivia will look at me and say, Andy, you have not put your clothes in the dirty laundry 390 times. If you do it 100 more times, I'm going to kill you in your sleep. Right? That's not what this is. This is not an invitation to, to count to 490. This is, set, this is symbolic, 70 times 7. This is, it's like asking, your mama, how, what mornings should I brush my teeth? If it's a morning, you brush your teeth. Right? If someone hurts you, you forgive them. Seven, 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 seven. You completely forgive as a way of life. Every day, you decide to forgive. That's how we roll. That's what it means to follow Jesus and for Jesus to be Lord. We keep on making that choice, whether we don't hurt them physically or talking smack about them or sabotaging them. We do not return evil for evil, but we overcome evil with good. Now, there are two myths about forgiveness we need to be clear about, two myths that make it hard to forgive. The first myth is you've got to feel it. If someone hits you, do you feel like forgiving them? No. Right? Someone hits me, you know what I want to do? I want to hit them back. Right? Does your feeling have anything to do with your decision? No. My decision not to hit you back is the forgiveness. If I had to wait till I felt like it to forgive, I'd be waiting a long time. Forgiveness is a decision we make. And I'm glad it is, because that means I don't have to control my emotions to forgive. I just have to get off my rear and do it. I, I just have to decide I am going to forgive and then do it. So the first myth is that forgiveness is something that you have to feel. It's not. It's a decision. The second myth around forgiveness is, you ever hear the phrase forgive and forget? Right? What tomfoolery is that? What's the quickest way for me to get you to think about a pink elephant? Hey, don't think about a pink elephant. What are y'all thinking about? How did that elephant get to be pink? Right? If someone walks in the door that's hurt you, you're going to remember it. Forgive and forget will never work. Your ability to forgive someone has nothing to do with forgetting. You forgive and remember. Because that's how we work. We forgive and remember. That's part of deciding to forgive them again and again and again. You have to remember that something happened. So, that, so we forgive and remember. So those are the two myths. It's not about how you feel. And, and you don't have to forgive and forget. You forgive and remember. It's this decision we make often. Because otherwise we get caught up in holding a grudge. Who here has ever held a grudge? You are far better people than I am. <laughs> For those of you who have held a grudge, it's hard, isn't it? It takes work. You're thinking about how to get, get, get back at, that sense of like getting even with, getting back at someone. It takes effort to hold a grudge. We are called to forgive so we can stop focusing on the past, on what has happened, and focused on healing and getting better. There will be a scar where we, where we have been hurt. There will be pain. Forgiveness does not negate that there has been damage caused. But forgiveness is what keeps it from getting worse. Forgiveness doesn't say it, was, it didn't hurt. Forgiveness is what keeps it from getting worse. Because it will get worse if what we're focused on is getting back at the person who hurt us. To get a little bit more visual, if you're always trying to get back at someone and always trying to wring their neck, who are you always looking at? And do you want to spend your time staring at the person who's hurt you? Right? you let go, stop trying to wring their neck, and, and move on. Now, if you want an example of this, I want to point out an amazing example of it. It is an act of bravery by a politician that I cannot, th is unequaled as far as I can remember in the last 50 years. If you can think of something more brave a politician has done, I want you to tell me because I'm intrigued. And I'm going to bring up a political situation, but that does not mean I'm condoning anyone's politics. I am not taking a political stand. I'm looking at a one, one particular situation. Is that, that clear? Not, not, okay. When Gerald Ford pardoned Nixon, could you think of anything braver that a politician has done? 
Because it cost him, didn't it? What did it cost him? The election. It cost him deeply. But think back to when that happened. Nixon had won re-election in a landslide. We forget how big that landslide was because then the Reagan landslide down the road comes. But this was a very significant landslide of an election. And so Nixon has been entrusted with a second term. And here we go. It's going to be a great presidency. And then the tapes come out. And it becomes clear that Nixon has besmirched and dishonored the office, and Nixon resigns. But that doesn't mean he's safe, right? That doesn't mean that he's clear, because that just means that the, the, the Senate can't have the trial to kick him out. He is still legally liable, and that still could have unfolded. And what did everyone suspect at the time? Some of you were around. When Ford pardoned Nixon, what was the scuttlebutt? What did people wonder? Was there a deal? Right? Was there a deal? Right? If I pardon you, then I get to be president. Yep, I'll take that deal. Right? Everyone was wondering what had happened. What Ford knew, when he became president, he knew that he was spending up to half of his days dealing with Watergate. That's what had happened. That, that after uh, Ford becomes president, he was spending vast chunks of his days dealing with Watergate. And how long had Watergate already been going? Two, two and a half years? Right? And what Ford looked at was if they went forward with a prosecution, which he had every right to do, Nixon had sucker punched the country, and the country, led by Ford, had every right to throw the book at him, every right to haul him before court, every right. And what he also knew is if they'd done it, they would first had to go to the Supreme Court to figure out who, can, who, can, who has standing against the president. Then you would have to have the trial, and then you would have the appeal. And how long does the trial take? I mean, it would have been three years of trials. And how much damage did Watergate cause the nation? Could you imagine the, dam the more damage it would have caused if you'd spent three more years dealing with that? And remember, what else was going on at the time? Anyone else remember what unemployment and inflation was like? 12% inflation, 9% unemployment. And so what Ford did, and it was a brave act of forgiveness, was he forgave Nixon. He pardoned him. He said, we're going to stop looking at the past. We're going to stop obsessing over what just happened. We're not going to hit you back so that we can start to heal and move forward. Now, did I misconstrue anything about that? Did I whiff on any of those details? Right? But I just want to make sure I, I didn't. But that, man, that was impressive. And it cost him something, didn't it? Anyone who talks about forgiveness without admitting that there could be a cost is not really grappling with it because it cost him the election. But was it the right thing to do? Yes, it was. It was brave, and it was Christ-like, and I greatly respect him for doing it. Now, I doubt that anyone here is in a position to forgive presidents. Anyone know any presidents? Oh, come on. I was hoping. You get a story. Right. I don't know any presidents either, but I do know that there are people who I would not smile if I saw them walk into the room. Right? There are people who I have a problem with. To confess Jesus as Lord, which was... If you weren't here last week, that was the sermon. Jesus is Lord. You're welcome. That was the short version. Uh, to confess Jesus is Lord means that we forgive like he forgave. Because what Jesus did, like what is the central thing Jesus did? It is was well, of the forgiveness on the cross. That is the beginning of our salvation. If anyone ever asks you, when were you saved? Here's the answer. When Jesus said from the cross, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Right, when Jesus forgives, that's the decision he makes. Do you think Jesus felt like forgiving? If someone shoves big old steel nails through your wrists, do you think he'd feel like forgiving? No, but it's a decision he made. He just said, he decided, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. That's a choice he made, and we are called to make, make that same choice again and again and again. Now, you probably have some questions. You're probably wondering, Pastor, Jesus says turn the other cheek, and that's fine, but when do I duck? Right? When do I stop? That's a great question. That's next week. Like, what, forgiveness is good, but how do I get over it? How do I make it better? Again, great question. That's next week. We're going to talk about repentance and reconciliation. But before anything else can happen, we have to start with forgiveness, or else the marriage won't last. It just won't work, right? We have to, to be together. We have to be able to forgive. So here is my vow to you. Here is my commitment. I'm going to forgive. 
I'm going to forgive daily. I'm going to forgive every time. When something goes wrong, not if, when something goes wrong, I am not going to hold a grudge. I'm not going to do it because Jesus is Lord, and I follow him, and he forgives me, and so I forgive you. I invite you to do the same. I invite you to commit or recommit to do the same, to pray for your enemies, to pray to be people who decide to forgive. And you might say, I don't have any, any enemies, let me ask you a question. When you're walking down the aisle in Walmart, if you hear a voice one aisle over, is there any voice you'd hear that would make you wonder whether you really needed to go get the milk? Right? If there's anyone whose voice you would hear and think, maybe I'll get that later, you do have someone you need to be working on forgiving, don't you? It's a choice we make. Pray for those who have hurt us. Forgive them. Decide again and again and again, I am not going to hurt them back. We do this to learn how to accept the forgiveness that Jesus offers us. Father, forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And we do it so we can let go of the brokenness of the past and turn towards a future that Jesus calls us to. A future that is beautiful. A future that is together. A future that we get glimpses of. And one of the, one of the glimpses I saw of this, again going back to the joy and the beauty of people who are married and learn to forgive and love each other. It's been a few years. I was walking into Walmart and I saw way ahead of me, I saw a couple. And they were moving kind of slow because they, they were older and uh, they were holding hands and they were walking real close to each other. And I stopped and I looked and I said, that, that, that's it. Right there. That is a couple that is beautiful in their ability to love and to forgive. And I don't, know, I don't even know their names. I just, I just stopped and watched them walk in. And I thought, that, that is what Jesus is calling us to do. Walk together as people who can forgive. Amen.